All right, we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are here on StreamYard again, going live here at the Authority Project. You are the project. And we want to slap authority onto your name so you can sell what you're great at. Um, but we're going to take a little bit, little bit of a turn today. Uh, we still do a little, little bit of marketing today. Still, we'll still be working on authority, of course. But we're taking a little bit, a little bit of a turn today to discuss race and how that applies to marketing online, and how you can, how how we sh how should we discuss it with our marketing platforms? I have some guests coming in, but they're. Running, appears to be running a little bit late, so I'm a little bit nervous right now. <laughs> um, but they're not showing up here. Uh, but the show must go on. And I am, just for me, I've had some, a lot of discussions here with different people this week, and from marketers, from mar our marketing friends, and it's been very interesting, and we're going to talk about all of that, about how we embrace it, how do, how do we talk about it, and how do we go about saying it the right way, because I think the issue is how to say it the right way, and that's been a big issue with this whole thing. So I'm going to bring um, Darren in right now, because he's here, he jumped on. Um, uh, we'll bring him on right now. Let's we'll bring him in. Hey, hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, yes, great. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. How you doing today, Darren? I'm doing well. I'm blessed and highly favored. Blessed and highly favored. And let me just go ahead and I, I'm not going to introduce you. You're going to introduce yourself. <laughs> Tell us about basically, first of all, before we get started, like who you are personally and who you are professionally. As well. Who am I personally? But okay, I was born in a manger with my mother Mary and my <laughs> father Joe. Wait a minute, that's Jesus. Okay, so basically, I'm a, a native New Yorker raised in Chicago, a marketer for 25, marketer brander for 25 years. Now, when I say marketer brander, I'm talking about for Universal, DreamWorks, MCA, Sony. Uh, Def Jam, DreamWorks, a whole bunch of things because I used to do the marketing for Jay Z, Eminem, Limp Bizkit, uh, Nelly Furtado. Uh, pretty much 200 of the most famous people out there before they were famous uh, because I worked for those big companies, uh, iHeartMedia and so on. And I marketed over $6 billion worth of films, a few little bitty ones you might have heard of, <laughs> uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, uh, the Star Trek series, the Fast and Furious series, the Star Wars series, as well as, um, you know, just some really cool stuff. Um, you know, I even have a piece of the... Where is it? Where is it? Of oh, the Fast and the Furious film somewhere oh. up here, right there, which is okay. super cool. And, uh, you know, just work with a lot of people. Um, in 2005, I was working at iHeartMedia in uh, New Orleans, and this Chicago guy knew nothing about hurricanes, and Hurricane Katrina came, which is ironic because the person who brought me down there, I knew from college and her middle name was Katrina. So I always tell people Katrina brought me in and out of New Orleans. <laughs> and I ended up uh, starting, um, I, I ended up in Texas, yeehaw, and starting a uh, from a FEMA paid for hotel, uh, started launching niche based websites, entertainment, film, music websites. And uh, years later, about five years later, uh, personal development legendary man, uh, Bob Proctor, said, Darren, in that cool, you know, Canadian voice, Darren, how you doing? Yes, six minutes to success, <laughs> Darren. So, Darren, you ought to go into business or whatever for yourselves, and you ought to go ahead and do your own thing and uh, start training people how to get online. So, next thing you know, I was online, and, uh, you know, from there on, I've been teaching people everything about how to build virtual workshops and how to uh, create their own micro subscription programs and um, how to become the only authority in the marketplace and how to build and brand themselves in a way where they're contrasting, standing out from everybody else. And uh, that's been 15 years of fun, man. Awesome. awesome. So we're going to talk about, we'll give you a chance to show, 
show who, who you are, where you are, where people can find you. And I'm hoping to get Galen, Galen in here eventually here, shortly here. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and start our discussion because I know we, we talked about this a, a while back a little bit, right? About um, about marketing in, in, in certain ways as far as um, the uh, the culture for, for black people and how, how it's been a, quite a bit of a, a disparity. And I, I, that's not even one of my questions today, but it's, an, it's, it's something that we probably should discuss during this part of, 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 the, of this discussion. But let's go first. What I want to do is that I think that some people are looking at this where they see this these events as isolated. And I, I want to go through, I'm going I'm to share my story too, but I want you to share your story. Just, just a few things about your experiences, your own personal experiences with racism. Because I think people think it's isolated. But I think if we, if we start sharing that, you know, this is, this is not something that come, that's here and there. It's actually a real thing, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you just share a few things that you've gone yeah. through in your life with racism? Issues, issues with race. Okay. Okay. First of all, I was trying to make sure I actually got in over here uh, mm -hmm. and and you know got in on your page as well. Okay. So yeah. I could you know so I just muted everything so if everybody heard the double <laughs> voices and stuff. Um, so big up to people. I see Mark Campbell in there and some other people. I I just jump in and say hello to. Uh -huh. um, you know, just kind of keep that in touch personableness yes. happening. Uh, yeah. Experiences with racism. Oh my God! Where do I begin? Um, <laughs> well, I'm the son of. I'm the son. I'm the great grandson. Great grandson of somebody who. Um, my my great grandmother basically had her house burned down by the Klan. Oh, wow. uh, she was one of those people who said, "I should do a post probably on this." She said, um, "Hey, listen." Um, you know, had 13 brothers and sisters and they all came with guns in hand. And she said, put down the guns, pick up the shovels. This too shall pass and we're going to keep moving. And she moved and loved and talked and loved. True, true story. Um, mm -hmm. My grandmother came out of Mississippi, came up to Chicago, first to Detroit, then over to Chicago. And uh, she, you know, obviously experienced a lot of you know, segregation in Chicago being one of the most segregated cities to this day in America. Um, but then when I bring that back to my mother and the times that they grew up in, my mother marched with King and literally was driving King around and driving some of the other protesters around. And with her, her and my grandfather, uh, my mother's father's life on the line doing that in the 60s. She's always been involved with the protests. My sister was uh, working with Mar with uh, Stevie Wonder to get a Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, she was first black woman, everything in law um, mm -hmm. and opening up doors left and right for people. Uh, mm -hmm. I come from a, a activist family, a family that's been involved uh, for quite some years, as far as racism, I mean, it goes as it, it goes as early as you know me moving in a good neighborhood. We had a Jefferson moment where we moved on up. Then you know when mom got divorced, <laughs> moved on out <laughs> back to the hood. So you know in that area, the first time you know picking up the phone in that neighborhood and hearing the N word, and being called names and called you know all sorts of God knows what. God bless them. Um, and then on top of that. You know, that was my introduction in Chicago, not to the Ku Klux Klan, even though they existed everywhere, was really the Nazis, because I couldn't mm -hmm. figure that out as a kid. Why in the world are Nazis? I thought we were fighting in World War II against them. So, you know, there was always times at school when there were where there were troubles and there were times and there were issues. Um, there were times, you know, uh, dealing, dealing uh, with community people we had a problem because it was one of those cases where, oh, they're moving in, and I guess we were the ones moving in. We can yeah. pretty much go into a deep conversation about that later, probably about you know the five part parts of inst institutional racism that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you end up growing up in in that environment. Um, you know, my mom did protests and stood with other people in the neighborhood. It's the Beverly neighborhood here in Chicago mm -hmm. against the uh, Nazi movement that was trying to happen mm -hmm. and kick off. Yeah. So there was always a thing that was happening 
historically uh, in my life, uh, through throughout my life, uh, racism. Yes, getting stopped by the police. It was interesting because you know I was one of those people who always fought the ticket, even if I was wrong. I didn't care. I was the Johnny. I used to tell my teachers who in law like I, I was the Johnny Cochran of tickets because I would <laughs> fight that bad boy off all the time. And I've actually caught officers who admitted to the courts that they, you know, tried to stop me on a yellow light, mm. saying it was red and beat the ticket the whole nine. I've been through that. I think the craziest thing that happened I watched was when I was working in radio in New Orleans, um, we got hit in the station vehicle while I was driving it. And the lady who hit us, the officer was waiting. What was he waiting for? He was waiting for the lady's husband to show up with the insurance information. They didn't have it in the car. They didn't have it in the car. And then he wrote this report like it was all my fault. And then what <laughs> happened was, God bless, the guy who was the um, prosecutor in, in the whole thing, we didn't even go to court with it because he's like, wait a minute. He said all this stuff about you. I said, I guess he forgot to mention that she didn't have her insurance on. Uh, He's like, no, you're kidding. I'm like, no, the car drove up. And the guy who was with me, he was in the band with me. He said, yeah, the car drove up and you know, that's what happened and, you know, boom. So there was there was always this preferential treatment. Um, of course, you know, be, being a black male, it made it a thing where it was kind of, you know, just little things, you know, like I'd go to my mom's job and there'd be somebody working there. And they, this one lady, she walked right past her and say, hey, hey, Sally, Sally. He's like, oh, I didn't see you, I didn't see you. I was like, what do you mean you didn't see me? You know, I'm right here. Right. Basically, <laughs> she saw a young black dude, and I wasn't yeah. thugged out or nothing. It was like young black dude. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to antagonize. I don't want to intimidate. I don't want to blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's always been something that's happened personally. Uh, mm -hmm. This happened. Um, even working for major media companies, mm -hmm. there's always this double thing where we had the guy who's the regional director in Chicago. He wanted me to target all of the black and Latino um, record stores and and see if they were selling albums early. What that meant is back then they were giving the big deals to Best Buy and they gave the big deals to Best Buy so they got the biggest cut. If Best Buy had a Tuesday they were going to open on, they always made sure they shipped a week early, of course, so they had it in all the stores. So the way the independent stores, uh, Brian, would make money is that yeah. they would have to sell it before it got out in Best Buy. If they could sell it before it got out in Best Buy, they would make money. So they wanted me to check on all the black and Latino stores. I was like, hmm, interesting. What about the white stores? You know, oh, no, someone else will check that. I'm like, yeah, right. Nobody else checked that. And uh, frankly, I didn't check the black and Latino stores. I wasn't going to do that to them. I mean, that was the only way they were going to make money. Um, they within the corporation of Universal and these other companies, they had a certain speak on urban music and things that they thought would and would not happen in that area. Um, it was an interesting dynamic across the board. When I got in radio in New Orleans in the South, it was a whole new world for me. It's like, oh my God, okay, you know. So I mean, there are different variances of racism. Uh, mm -hmm. Being a man of color and um, I began to understand too when I worked in the media at iHeartMedia that the reality of this is is that you have a um, you have a a a media that doesn't really care about the color as much as they do to hype their attention for ad dollars. So they're using politics, they're using race, they're using whatever, just like they use with Gail King. You know, to to do the way they did when she was talking about R. Kelly. No, she was talking about um, what was she talking about? Oh, Kobe, and they yeah, used yeah. Kobe. Uh, you know, the whole Kobe thing. You know, oh man, why'd you ask that? And you know, Gail kind of fell off for a minute because she forgot yeah. about the fact that they're gonna hype it up regardless. And if there's something they can create friction with, their attention for ad dollars. So I was working within that beast, watching people be used whether it be race, color, or whether it be politics mm -hmm. or whatever, it was attention for ad dollars that they could use because they're using billions of dollars against us. That's what we're up against on a regular basis, a billion dollars worth of uh, ads that are happening. And what's happened now, if you noticed, um, is that with this changeover, we've had this different 
thing happen where people are talking more about the beating of black people versus the black people that are bad, that robbed, that did this, that did that. The narrative has changed slightly. Whether it flipped back or not, we hope not, but you know, you get the idea. Yeah. yeah. So That's yeah, I mean, yeah, there's there's been racism <laughs> both in media, racism both in the record industry and the entertainment mm -hmm. industry. Um, there, you know, the deals are different for the black artists. Mm. And uh, they try to communicate that. But of course, if you communicate that too much, you get ostracized. Mm. Uh, there have been, you know, there's a difference. Even as I left the media and started in the online world, um, it's been interesting because 90% of my clients are white just by happenstance. I don't target them that way. It just is. But the, you know, but the interesting part about that is that, you know, there's there's been, you know, this, you know, the different language that happens between them because they try to be politically correct, whereas I'm politically direct. You know, I, I feel like, no, just say it, you know, just say it, come on out, let's yeah. talk about it and have yeah. real conversations with it. I have clients who are Trump voters and, you know, I'm one of those people who don't believe that all Trump voters are racist. I just believe he is. And the whole idea is that, you know, <laughs> they voted for that agenda and I remind them every time something fucked up goes wrong, I come back and I say, oh, well, I'm sorry, am I supposed to say the F word here? Did I say that wrong? But, I, I, I can tell uh, you not to. <laughs> I, well, I, well, I will just try to curve out. I, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, know, a cussing, know. I'm a cussing Christian. So, you know, just pray <laughs> for me three times. But, you know, basically when I have these Trump voter clients, they love me. Yeah. But they hate Obama. They love me, which is so tripped out because you see it on social media. I can't stand Obama. Hey, Darren, I love you. What's going on, man? And I'm like, okay, all right, all right. Um, you know, I was like, you do know I worked the Obama campaign. I love to throw that back at me. Like, ah, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's basically um been a journey, both personally, professionally, and with my business, talking mm -hmm. with people. But I, you know, being able to communicate that, Brian. Um yeah. You know that's 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 been my journey with with race. Um, the recent thing that's happened in the last week or so is that I really just started busting out from a public enemy perspective. <laughs> just saying, you know, yeah. don't fight the power, be the power. Here, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say that. If it disagrees with you, two tears in a bucket, mother. Well, you gotta, you see how to handle that because I don't want to throw any bad more words off there, be naughty. But yeah. You get the idea. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Galen, um, I'm glad you come uh, came in here. We are discussing, first of all, just your personal experience with racism in your own life. And I'll go, I'll go next too, because I think that people need to know that it's not nicely the incident, but you know, with these with, with these current events that they think it's just one, two, three. No, it's it's years and years of different of all of us you know, experiencing that. So why don't you tell, tell your story about what you've experienced just in your life. Okay, well, thank you for having me and hello to you, Darren. Um, hey, personally, hey, um, I went to a private Christian school um, where I was the only black kid in my class. Mm. So I learned about prejudice very, very early. I think I was as early as probably about six or seven years old. Um, one day we didn't see color. Um, in the way that people say it now. Um, but, you know, that was just my white friend, Johnny, you know, my brown friend, Galen. And, you know, we loved each other. We played with, play with each other. And then one day, all of a sudden, they come to school and say, you're black. Mm. Or, you know, like, yeah, I've always been this. But what has happened is they've gone home, sat at the dinner table, and heard their father or their grandparent or their mother say something stereotypical or negative about Black people. And all of a sudden, they have learned prejudice. So mm -hmm. I do not believe that we were born with it. I think we were taught it. And especially um, white people, they're taught prejudice. Because I have experienced firsthand, you know, just one day we're friends and the next day I'm different. And mm -hmm. I've experienced in that private school, um, just growing up having birthday parties. Everybody has a birthday party. I get to go to the party. Everybody else gets to spend the night. But I don't mm -hmm. get to spend the night. Or when it's time to have my party, they're not coming to my neighborhood. They'll come to the public party, like the skating rink or the movies, and then they never sleep over my house. So I've experienced prejudice in my personal life. And then, you know, trying to stick up for myself. I remember being in school 
and someone calling me a slave. And I had to educate my classmate, like me, third grade, telling a classmate, hey, that ended with Abraham Lincoln. That's years ago. I'm no, I'm no longer a slave. Black people are not slaves. And I witnessed the teacher in silence, which is what they're doing now. The leaders are being silent right now. And I witnessed the teacher just sitting there watching me defend myself to my white classmate. And she not saying a thing, not correcting the classmate, giving a lesson on history, telling her, you know, what we should be doing right now. And so I've witnessed white people being silent my entire life. And I've witnessed prejudice. And it's like the soft, unspoken prejudice. It's not <laughs> the blatant, you know, burning across in my yard prejudice. It's that the internal kind and kind of what I call like passive aggressive type prejudice. Um, I've worked in um, customer service. You know, the simple things that we notice when we're um, receiving cash from a white customer, instead of touching us, they want to drop it, drop the money in our hands and not want to touch our hand. Like, these are the things mm -hmm. I've experienced, um, you know, just working as I got older. And then um, in my business, um, I started doing online marketing, I think about 2012. And um, just recently, oh, within the past three years or so, I joined a community because I build funnels for customers. And um, in that funnel community, I know I've helped uh, plenty of people in that community and they thank me in the messenger um, in, in my inbox for helping them, you know, create their business, formulate a message for their uh, marketing, um, helping them get sales and, and results and more clients. But in that community, if somebody uh, acknowledges Jane Doe for what she's done for them, Jane Doe overnight. Um, her business changes, her life changes. She makes thousands of dollars. People start following her. So just the testimonial can change a business. But I never get the public acknowledgement um, when I help my white peers. I just get the thank you and the message, but never the testimonial, never the thank you, never the public acknowledgement in that group, which could have changed my life. And I know it's really hard to kind of give props to the underdog, but I feel like you know, it's because of my skin color. I have no choice but to look through that lens based on my personal experiences. Like, you don't want to give me credit because I'm the black girl. And probably they think it won't bother me because I'm used to being, you know, the bottom of the total pole. So they don't realize their style is how it affects us. Mm. Awesome. Now, I just want to, uh, come over. <laughs> that's all. I know there's a whole lot. I, put, I, I have seven questions. That was, we're still on the first question. So you can see how much, how much this thing is um, for us. Like, I'll just quickly just go down. Like, the first time, first time I was told I, I was an N word was when I was about same, same time as you, about six or seven in the elementary. Okay. I was called Blackie and I was, you know, I was I was the I I was taken from my urban my urban roots going into a sub suburb because a father wanted us to have a better way you know so I was a suburban kid you know the only black family amongst you know everybody I've been you know I, in I used the Boston to area in the Boston area yeah yeah in the Boston yeah. area okay yep so I was in Greater Boston a town called Milton so there's many experiences I I don't want to get into everything I've been told like. You, you, would, you would like this, Darren. I was told that uh, back in the day, rap music wasn't real music in my face. I mean, somebody would actually came to me and said, yeah, of course. you know, do you, do you know that rap music isn't, isn't real music, right? I was like, okay. Like, like, like I was, you know, into rap music. I was, but you know, it's like, you, you know, it's just like the, the, the gall of, of saying that. Um, I've been stopped several times by the police in my life several times just driving while black two times in a, in a two-week period okay um so get that so i'm just like and i've never had a criminal record i've never been to jail i've just been driving while black i'm not a criminal but i was looked upon as one so in the digital marketing world i can i can tell you how many times i've been Push back, but I, I don't want to get too much, too much. That I, I, I will say that I wasn't given the the go ahead by a lot of my white peers of, of partnering or having bad partners or, or, or of that nature, and I think that it has pushed me back. But let's go forward. 
because we can go on going with that forever. Um, so my next question is, what do you guys think is the right response in general or just as a digital market? Because we're, we're talking about the digital marketing space. Darren, you go. I thought we were going to do ladies first now. <laughs> yeah, ladies first, ladies first. You're right. You're right. <laughs> well, well, I've witnessed uh, two differences. I were three white leaders that I follow in digital marketing. Um, mm. Um, I'm in, like I said, I'm in a funnel community. I'm just going to name them. Um, I'm in a funnel community called ClickFunnels. 100,000 followers, members in that community. And their leader, the, the CEO founder, his name is Russell Brunson. And um, he made a, a video saying, you know, I was not aware of what was going on. He said, you know, I'm focused on my business. I don't watch the news. I don't watch the TV. The only time I know what's going on is when my kids say something on social media or my wife says something. And he said that he learned about Dr. Martin Luther King years ago. And he thought that the racism that, that's going on right now, he thought that it ended years ago. Um, a lot of people were upset with the fact that he was not aware, but the the bad part, how he handled it, mishandled it, was he offered $250,000 to make a documentary sharing um, our stories of how we experienced, you know, prejudice and racism. And um, he took that post down, he took that opportunity down, not because uh, we were upset, because his white community was upset. He had an opportunity oh, really? to fund a documentary documentary well, like we're doing right now, sharing our stories where oh, the really? black community <laughs> could could tell tell their stories. And the funny thing was um so many of the white members of that click farms community, they were quick to share their story about the time they got pulled over by a police officer and then and um, they met a bad cop. And I told them, you know, it's different. You get to go home, you may get a fine, you may get a ticket, but it's different. When we get pulled over, we may not live to see another day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not to say that your story is not as significant as ours, but I think, you know, this is an opportunity and good for a guy who's making a hundred million dollars a year in his uh -huh. business to fund $250,000 towards a documentary to share our stories. And he took that post down. Did not he so say that? Yes. Did he, did he say that? What, what exactly did he say <laughs> as far as in writing? I'm about to start some shit. So wait a minute. What, what exactly did he say that made him take that Russell Bronson take? I know Russell. What did he, what did he say that took down a $250,000 offer to make that story? What exactly did he say? Well, he said the post is still up. The post where he offered the $250,000, he has taken mm. down. But the post of his excuse of why he's taking it down is still up. And from so my memory, when you get off of here, you can make a copy of that post. I'm going to friend you and you're going to send me that post <laughs> and send me a screenshot of that yeah. post. Uh, I'm trying not to cuss, Arnold, uh, uh, Brian, on your joint. But you're going to send me a screenshot of that post. What exactly did that post say, sister? He said that he talked to one of his black peers that he admired, which was one of his speakers at um, his Photo Hacking Live event. Mm -hmm. And um, he felt like, you know, he wasn't the right one to tell the story. And um, it was, you know, people, he addressed the not being unaware, not the fact that he changed his mind on the documentary, he, he was addressing the fact that he was not unaware, that he was not aware of racism. And so the result of that is he no longer was doing the documentary, but he decided to just um, um, give back to underprivileged, underprivileged kids, which is what they always do anyway. They always go to Africa. Yeah, he was doing that shit over in Africa. Excuse me. Look, yeah, yeah, they yeah. Do that he was doing that over in Africa, but yeah, I mean, wait a minute. So he stopped doing it because of what? Why did he stop doing that? He had a lot of complaints. He had more complaints from, like I said, the white members of the click from the community than the black people. Black people were not saying, don't do this documentary. We were just saying, make sure you do it right. Make sure you have representation at the table. I myself, I told him, hey, I teach people how to tell their story um, to attract clients. There was another woman, Sharice Floyd Thompson, who's a storyteller. We are both in his community 
patronizing his um, software. We're members of his community. This was a time to work with us. We contributed towards his $100 million business. And we mm -hmm. said, hey, let us be involved so that we can, you know, help you do this right. So, because we don't need you telling our stories. Let us tell our stories and let us go and find the people who've experienced. I've even recommended him to people like, you know, Dr. Umar Johnson, um, uh, people of that nature. Uh, I just gave him a list of names, the people who are current, and um, he took down the post. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, it, that was just one of two. The other two people were um, Marie Folio. She has since apologized, so let me say it in love. But when this happened in her group, oh, B -school. she had a B school community. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, go uh, ahead. She has Tell a huge community. I've um, been doing B school for like 11 plus years, had 130,000 plus people in her community. And um, Friday, someone in her community asked, like, where do you stand on this, on this issue? And um, somebody said, well, we don't want to talk about this. This is for B school. This is for business. Can we just not talk about this? And so the comments started, you know, people kind of attacking each other, saying, we need to talk about this. We need to know how to handle this in our business. That's what B school is all about. And she started deleting posts and deleting comments. And some mm -hmm. posts were able to stay, which was saying, hey, yes, let's move on with business. But the posts that were saying, let's talk about this were being deleted. So then she just silenced everyone. And she was silent. She was silent for that whole day did not make a post. I, I wouldn't say the whole day, probably an hour, a couple hours later, she came out and defended herself and said, I already made a post about this on my Instagram. And please please um, adhere to the guidelines of the community. And that was it. That's how she addressed it. Like, let's he uh, heed to the guidelines, adhere to the guidelines of the community. And I already made a post on Instagram. And then that, that contributed to more backlash in the community. It just got toxic. And then the next day she kept making more excuses and more excuses. Like, I'm just trying to protect women of color. Um, a year ago, somebody's post got threats. So I'm just shutting down everything so I can protect black women. And so um, finally, she has finally responded and apologized and said she was wrong and she, she realized that she hurt everyone and she has since opened up the comments again for people to make comments. But that is an example, again, of, you know, white leaders not knowing how to handle this. But I can say it took her a while, but she did come around and apologize and open up the thing. And for the whole week, people have been able to, you know, share resources and vent and express their anger. Black women have been able to space, express their anger white women have been able to share white tears and um so and the other person i think they handled it flawlessly was a leader named um, julie stowen and she has a community called the marketer's heart she was in click funnels as well their one funnel away challenge and um she was ahead of it she acknowledged this in her email like a week before it became a trending topic for most marketers like this is marketing for a lot of white marketers they're just doing it because all the other peers are doing it they're just posting you know let's have unity and what can i do to help is because they're doing it because everybody else is doing it not because they are aware of racism they really care yeah. but julie yeah. stone really was ahead of this like almost a week before it became a trending topic she was ahead of it and she said she makes sure that she's informed on everything she dedicates time to know what's going on in current events and in the world so she knows how to handle people in her community and that's how you should do as a leader black or white or any color awesome i I commend what you just said uh, on Maria. It's interesting because the way I saw it and I heard about it because I'm not in her B school or anything um, was another friend posted. Well, wow. Why can we talk about COVID, but we can't talk about this. If we can get all boisterous and you want to say this in COVID in the group, why can't you come in and break, you know, and break that off. Exactly. So I have something beeping off in the stove here for a minute. I don't know what's <laughs> going on live. It's like beep, 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 beep. What the heck just happened? Um, but uh, you know, it's it's the man. They didn't found me out. Oh, <laughs> damn. Um, <laughs> you know, no, but give me a moment because I want to get that annoying beeping out and I'll yeah. come back and but I but but yeah, I I was I did hear about Maria for for Relio, um Folio and 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 hear about that, but the argument with COVID was an interesting byproduct of that. Give me a quick second here as I figure out since it's not going to stop. Okay. Give me a second. I'll be right back. I don't know what that is. Hopefully it ain't. Hopefully it's not burning down here. You know. 
<laughs> Give me a say. No problem. But I, I guess in in my own response to that is this what 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 is the right response? I just in I've had some conversations with um a person I do a mastermind with every week as well. And I think I like the way he handled it. He he didn't just come out and do whatever. He said, let's talk about this, you know? Um, because I, you know, and he admitted or you know, he acknowledged that, you know, he needs to he needs to know more about this. And I think that's I think that's just getting to the first step of conversation <laughs> is 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 I think priceless right now. Just the, the, can we have a conversation about it? Don't shun it. Don't ignore it. Um, don't um, don't think that it doesn't mean anything because it does. It means a lot just to have a, at least a conversation to talk about it. And I, I don't think I don't think everybody understands just how much that means to to people of color that you at least acknowledge it and say, you know what, let's talk. Right. That's all, I mean, just, yeah. can we just start there? It, yeah. it may, it, and, then, and then it can be more fruitful where it grows into something that really, really creates some kind of change. But if you're not talking about it, we can't even start, you know? You know? We can't even start to do anything to, necessary to even work to a change. So, that's just my, yeah. my thing about that too, as far as yeah. digital marketers get get something oh. out there. It, it's not going to be correct. It's not going to be. It's not. And we don't want it to be politi politi politically correct. Just get something out there that says, you know what? If you don't know, it's okay. Just just talk about it, and and ask ask for some some guidance on it. And yeah, and I don't know if you want to talk on that, Darren. While you're back well, here. Again, well, again, my apologies, there, Maria and Russell. Created that beeping, and I didn't like when they, we were just jumping in on. It. I'm serious, sister. Screenshot that. Screenshot that. Screenshot that. Because I want to hear that conversation. Don't be because I mean I'm literally sitting next to Brussels. We we on the marketers cruise and everything, and kicking it and everything, and been you know back and forth via you know over the years, and you know in, in, so it's, it's it's you know this is before he was getting ready to blow up with click funnels. And everybody could have got it. I could have. I was one of the first people, and invited in in the of, the of groups of people for the whole affiliate and to be in on the ground floor of Click Funnels. And that was, you know, I never ended up joining Click Funnels, but it was like, you know, it was all good. But I would love to see that conversation that happened because I I would love to bounce that back and see if that that situation could at least get readdressed, especially now. Because it's funny, uh, Brian, you talking about that as far as people wanting to talk about things. Um, please go back. Let me make sure I'm addressing first your question, Brian, because what was the second question that you asked? So I can make sure that I'm addressing that first. Is there, is there a right response for, for digital marketers out there who have, who have, who have the platform um, well, in general? Is there or, a right response? Yeah. Now, when you say digital marketers, are you talking about people who are non-black or black or whatever? What, what? Either or. Okay. Um, I've seen some well, mistakes from, from black marketers too. So. Well, I work, <laughs> I, work, I work my way back from that. First of all, okay. from what you said, your comment there saying, man, I wish people would address it. Uh, what happened to George Floyd, um, I've been dealing with stuff that have that had different levels of it. The first level of of it is did it actually happen because you got these conspiracy theorists people who think you know because he was looking at the camera it didn't really happen it didn't really happen it was something that was fake economics and they really just going out on social media and i'm like you out your blankety blank mind you know i gotta love you brother be like <laughs> blankety blank I, I i let that off ah. but then there's that up next level is did he die from the dude having his knee on his neck I, I, I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, really? Really? Nine minutes, knee on the neck, and you talk about did it? Well, it could have been something else. Well, according to two autopsies, two, and I'm pretty sure they know what they do. There was a little something going on. He death from asphyxi asphyxiation. It's like, yeah, okay. Then there's that next level that goes below that, which, you know, um, you know, okay, it happened. Okay. He died because of this. And then the level below that was, 
Well, we shouldn't. Now, this one, I'm going to make some people mad, but it's like we shouldn't judge somebody in the court of in, in the court of the public court of opinion. And I'm like, they're talking about the officer. And I'm like, uh, no, he should go to jail and all of them should go to jail. Then the level below that is, oh, should they have been handcuffed the same time instead of just fired? Yeah, they should be fired, but should they be there? And then the level below that is, oh, should all the officers be charged? And then the level below that, mm. it just get crazy. The level below that of, of insanity to me was, oh, and that was a big one, Brian, you saw me have on my page, um, was, was there, you know, is there actual police brutality that targets black people and with white people who want to counter that say well there are more white people arrested well 70 percent people are white so yeah but if you take the same number of white people arrested the same number of black people arrested and look at the ratios you're like what the heck black and brown people getting targeted left and right i mean it is what it is mm -hmm. but you know let's not play that role so the ability to be able to see it there's a poet uh, a poet years ago who had this really cool ending to his poem he said and, and he, he was a black poet and he addressed it towards white people. He said, listen, uh, I don't want your sympathy. You can't give me empathy. I just wish you'd understand. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind that is, okay, if you want to talk about the problem, we can talk and we can have different variances of opinions, but at least the conversation kicks off. We can open it up. But if you don't want to see it, if you don't want to ignore it, if you want to, that's not the way to do it. Um, Bishop T.D. Jakes just pointed up, put, posted something out this week talking about, hey, listen, when you got an open wound, you can't, you know, you can't, um, you can't just close it up. You got to be able to solve what's in there. You got to set the bone. You got to do something before you say everybody's talking about mm -hmm. let's heal and love. Yeah, heal and love. But right now we ain't ready to heal and love, mother. You ain't ready to heal and love. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, ain't ready. we ain't ready to heal and love. We got some problems. It's been 160 years. And what the hell you mean heal and love? You know, we listen, you want to talk about heal and love? Yes. We all, you know, I don't believe that all white people are racist. I don't believe that all cops are bad. I think we absolutely need the police. And I also just got through posting saying, listen, and, I, and somebody hit me back, a, a sister who just got off of a protest just hit me back saying, please explain this to me because I don't believe the police should be defunded. They should be influenced. And they should be influenced in a way where it's like here in, in Chicago, the Chicago Public Schools has a $30 million contract with them. So I'm not saying, oh, defund them. I'm saying, Hey, you want that $30 million? You got them by the boss. Did, hey, you want that $30 million? Hmm, what we going to do about that $30 million? How are you going to handle pulling people over and doing this? You can get inside the unions, the blah, blah, blah. Um, bringing this back to what digital people should be saying, honestly, I respect the honesty of whites who are coming in saying, hey, listen, um, this is my belief. And even if it's a racist belief, I can respect the fact that they're at least honest with each other. But let's stop, let's stop playing the Stevie Wonder Ray Charles moment like you ain't seen nothing and ain't nothing <laughs> happened and we're going to be politically correct. Let's be politically direct. That's how we solve things. And even if we agree to disagree, we can have that open, honest conversation instead of just trying to cover up and look nice. It's great that you celebrated Netflix put out there saying we support black Blackout Tuesday. All right, let's just, let's support some more stuff. You Netflix, you know what you can do? Netflix can pick up the phone and call. They got a political arm that's really big. Instead of saying defund the police with this, let's influence the Congress, influence the mayors, influence the governors, and get to the people out there to talk to them about doing this. The digital marketers who are white, who are saying what they're saying, I respect their bold honesty, but like the sister was saying here, it's like, okay, it's one thing to put that out there, like you were saying, it's one thing to put that out there and say those nice things and niceties, but where's the other flip side of that? Where, where do we get in and start having a real conversation of how do we mend the problems, begin to mend the long-term solutions? So as far as digital marketers, what should they be saying? Speak your passion on either side of the game. For black folks, I'm telling them, listen, you know, it's it's time to just open up and get raw. And if you lose some customers, two tears in a bucket, mother effort. So
So the thing is, is that, you know, you being able to mend that whole thing is great, but we're in a $20 trillion GDP gross national product. And the way the recession is hidden, they're talking about 40 to 50% being lost. So that still leaves 10 trillion plus dollars. So there's still money in the marketplace. Somebody gonna do business with you. And guess what? All of them ain't gonna be black and that's okay because people want solutions, but you gotta speak from your heart. We do not have the uh, convenience or luxury of not addressing the culture. It's not that we have to throw our blackness at you. We got you, we black, you know, we got to throw out there, you know, revolution. Listen here, white tag. No, it's not about that. It's about having an honest, fair conversation about, listen, man, this ain't even about politics. We ain't talking about Republican, Democrat, conservative. We talking about life. We talking about people who are dying. It's the same conversation that's happened since my favorite movie, Do the Right Thing. It's like you so worried about why Mookie broke up Sal's pizza shop instead of worrying about why the hell did they kill Radio Raheem? Life right. over riots. Life over, and no, nobody on here I don't think condones um, you know, riots and violence and stuff. But the whole point is, is that, hey, man, why is it that you're on your page? And I've been calling out my friends on this. Why you've been on your page talking about you don't like no riots? Well, yeah, I don't like riots neither, but you ain't see the damn thing about George Floyd getting killed. All you talking about is the riot. Oh, the property. There's a property. The property's been hurt. You get more property. You can't get more people. Why don't you have a problem with that with the people? And I don't say I'm not saying you're a racist. And for some white people, I've had to address them on the whole shaming because there's some of that. Have you feel like race? You know, since this one down, you've been shamed. Ain't nobody trying to shame you. We're just trying to enlighten you about the fact that lives over that property. Do you realize how stupid Black Lives Matter should sound? We shouldn't have to say that. We shouldn't have to say Black Lives Matter. You know, that's like that's like saying you need to come. But all lives matter, really. Okay, let's show you the video again. You know, so the point is you're bringing it back in their face, but I'm telling the digital people on the white side, listen, be willing to have the conversation, the difficult conversation. Talk to other whites within your culture to solve this and deal with it. Be, be willing to open, be open, open up the wound and be careful um, not to close it up like Maria did. It's like, you don't want to do that. And I understand the PC was the old way. Now this is the new way, PD, politically direct. Bring it and let, let the difficult conversations fly. And if somebody unsubscribe or you lose business because of it, guess what? You're going to lose business anyway. One way you do one thing, one way the other, you got to do it. As far as black people are concerned, be willing to put your coach out there. Me personally, lady, uh, Brian, I I'm going to tell you right now, what, for 15 years, I always put the money over the politics, Mm -hmm. over the addressing it's not that i wasn't black it's just that i just didn't throw that out there through my business there and kept it on business and business and i'm still yeah. gonna keep it business yeah. but um now i'm ready to launch in somebody's butt now it's like ah you know like yo i'm i'm gonna bring out the conversations man real raw and relevant we're, we're in a tired mode, mode right now right we're tired we're tired it's yeah, 20. 20. It's a, it's but we've been tired <laughs> man this is crazy 160 years of freedom They've been 400 years, yeah, but I don't even talk about slavery. Slavery, by definition, is all tacked up. So it's like you supposed to have all the messed up things of slavery. It's like being mad at a lion for eating a baby. That's a horrible thought, but it's a lion. But as far as freedom's concerned, you telling us we're free for 160 years, but at the same time, you've been whipping our butts. You've been kicking us down. I mean, Will Smith said it best. Racism isn't getting worse to you, maybe to Russell, to Maria, maybe, maybe it's getting worse to them. But the thing is, it's racism and getting worse. As he said, it's getting recorded. So now you're seeing that this yeah. happened. This ain't hearsay. This ain't a word of hearsay. You know, when you talk about Ferguson, there was no recording that was happening for Ferguson, but you just saw the equivalent of what's happening right now, whether you believe Ferguson or not. You can't, you know, even though there are these people on these levels I just pointed out, you just can't uh, dispel that. That's just, it's happening, it's real. Let's talk about it, but let's not only talk about it, what solutions can we do economically as entrepreneurs to address it? Awesome. I just want yeah. to acknowledge, I know the good people on here, I'm not trying to ignore you. I see your comments on here. I appreciate you all coming through here. It's going to be kind of difficult to address. If you have questions, just put questions on there. I do love the comments on there. Um, but if you have questions, let us know, and we'll address it as well. Um, I, was, I want to start with 
Let me, Galen, do you have any anything as far as actions everyone can take right now? I, I know Darren put a lot of lot of out there about actions. What 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 can we do right now? Because I know people. Are, I still have people. Some of my counterparts are trying to figure out. Talking is good. Talk. How can I say? It? Yeah. Talking is good, right? Yeah. But there's some points where now we feel like talking has been getting kind of cheap. Exactly. So, so what are the, what are the actions? Is it just bringing money? Is it just funding people? Is it just like awareness? What what do you want to see beyond the conversation? Well, yes. as you mentioned, all the above of what you mentioned, but um, I'm going to talk about what actions they can do, but I'm more concerned of what we can do. Black okay. digital marketers, black entrepreneurs, I'm more concerned of what we need to do going forward. I know right now the conversation, for some reason, the attention always gets back on them, even though this is supposed to be Black Lives Matter and, and how black people feel, but all I'm getting is, oh my gosh, it, from white people, I didn't know, I'm hurt, I'm ashamed, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, we've been tired. I'm hearing about their, I'm trying to empathize with them, but it's like they're still bringing attention back on them. What can I do? What we need to do? I'm so sorry. I'm not concerned about what you need to do because you haven't done anything up until this point. My whole 12 years in marketing, they haven't done anything for me. So I'm not concerned about what they can do. I'm more concerned about what we need to do as African-Americans, as black people in business going forward. We need to patronize each other. We need to support each other. Um, I'm getting ready to start promoting a whole nother software for funnels saying, hey, there's a click phones community with a hundred thousand people they only talk about the same black people myron golden and two other black people every year year after year a hundred thousand people you only know three black people you only put three black people on your platform on your stage mm. every year on your webinars on your interviews the same ones come on now so let's stop asking them let's stop begging them let's stop telling them what they can do for us. I don't need you to do anything for me. Okay. Mm. I have uh, power in my dollar. I have intelligence. I can move on. I've been operating without you. I really don't care <laughs> what you do. And I'm saying that out of love. I'm saying that out of love for black people. I want us to come together. I want us to uplift each other. I want us to stop thinking white is right. I want us to, to love ourselves and think that we are good enough to invest in each other, to lift each other up. That's what I want us to do. I want us to all go read Dr. Claude Anderson's book, Powernomics, so we can learn how to create a system of our own and stop trying to just battle the um, racial systematic racism, create our, create our own system, create our own police, our own community, build our own government. Read Dr. Claude Anderson's Power Numbers books. That's one thing we can do. We're concerned about gun laws and gun rights. If you want them to be changed, every black person needs to go and purchase a legal firearm. That's how we can make change. You want them to change the laws? The first moment they start realizing black people buying guns, they, they will change the law. I'm <laughs> telling you. They won't come for you. They think every black person is armed. They won't approach you like they do now. They don't think that you're weak. Start owning things. That's the first thing you can own. Own a gun, own a business, then start working on real estate, have ownership. They think that you're weak, you're less than because you don't own anything. We don't have the economic power that we should. Now, we do contribute $1.2 trillion in the economy, but we contribute it to them. They're getting the money, they're getting the benefits. We're not putting it on us. We're giving it to them, we're giving it to Jordans, we're giving it to, to hair, we're giving it to, to uh, name brand clothing. We're giving it to these white leaders who don't care about us. We're seeing right now, instead of telling them, hey, you hurt us, you hurt our feelings by saying, hey, by saying, talking about looting, don't even address it. Just take your money elsewhere. Take your money elsewhere. There's a brand new, um, I'm not trying to pitch them, but there's a brand new um, funnel building software called Groove Funnels. Start investing in them. They're beta from the ground up. That can be the black funnel community. We don't have to keep begging other people to be a part of. Stop begging white people for, for love and attention. Stop doing it. Create your own community. Create your own government. You, you know, I don't want to sound too extreme, <laughs> but I'm just saying mm -hmm. that's what we can do as black people. What can we do for each other? Um, so just in general, if you don't like what your white leader, and I'm, I don't mean white leader, but someone who's a leader of your community that that's happened to be white, if you don't like what they're doing, what they're saying, stop investing in them. 
take your money elsewhere, take your money to another business. It's just like all the companies that are endorsing towards the campaign of Donald Trump. If you don't like Trump, stop investing in these businesses that fund his campaign. So that's just how I feel about it. Um, I can talk about what white people can do one for, but I really don't care because they haven't been doing anything before. But for us, we need to invest in ourselves and our own communities. We need to have police our own communities. You think about the Asians. Do you hear about policing and um, murders of Asians by cops? You don't hear that all the time because they have a community where if you come in Chinatown, if anybody murders another Asian, they're going to be dealt with. The community is going to deal with it. Their police may not see another day or even if their own kind. We don't hurt our own kind. We don't hurt anybody in this community. We don't do that kind of stuff. So we need to have some kind of strategic um, mobilizing underground organizing where we say, hey, we're not going to let anybody come in our community and murder us or hurt us. And we need to have that kind of those are the kind of things we need to have in play. So I'm concerned with what black people can do going forward, not white people. OK. Amen. Amen. <laughs> OK. Right. I hear you. I hear you. Now, what, what I don't want to I understand some of the things you say, Gail, I, I don't want to say that white people don't haven't done anything for us in 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 its entirety but i i understand i understand your your where you're coming from as far as the pain that you're coming from um and i get that um definitely not have haven't done if you if i was to say i don't, don't want to be i don't know maybe maybe not enough obviously obviously maybe the better word is not enough possibly right. um so and I just want people who are listening in, just like, just feel the anger. Feel, feel, feel. It's, it's, it's feel. It's, it's, it's more. It's more tired than anything, because I think, even for me, like, I'm, I'm looking at Ahmad, just seeing that, I, I, I've become, which is crazy to say, but I, I was, I've become desensitized to the whole thing. Because it seems hopeless that the same thing is happening over and over again, and I don't see the change. And I don't know if change will come. I'm not sure if I believe in that at this point. We're trying to. <laughs> we're trying to get it there, but it is, it is hard. And thank you, Matt, for coming in here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, one of my mentors there. Um, what do you guys say? I got a few more questions here, but what do you guys think as far as as far as that? Do you believe that change? I'll put it into two words, two questions here. Um, do you believe that change will come? And I think I think we all know that racism, racism will always exist in some form or fashion. But does it? Do you think that it will continue? I think we we all don't want it to exists the way it is now, where it's rearing its ugly head in this, in this way all the time. So do you think that belief that change will come? And if so, how? <laughs> how, 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 how can it be? How can that change come if you believe that, it, that it'll, it'll come? So do you go ahead first, then I'm going to go back and take a step back from the, the previous question and, okay. and work my way up there. But go ahead first. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so like I said, uh, as far as the change, um, I don't think racism would end, at least no time soon. And just like I said before, the change that we can make um, is uh, we have, like I said, $1.2 trillion spending power um, for Blacks. Um, that's equivalent to the eighth largest country in the world. If we, you know, strategize where we're going to put our dollars that will make a significant change. I know we just had Blackout Tuesday, but there was a previous movement that was being organized. I don't know who came up with Blackout Tuesday, but there was already a previous movement being organized by Blacks for July 7th, 2020 to be the official Blackout. And yeah, that I heard that where no Black person would spend a dollar on that day. No penny, no dime, do not spend a dollar on that day and speaking of blackout tuesday black leaders have made mistakes as well there's a black um, leader um i don't know her full name but she goes by coach stormy in her community 
and um, she heard she had backlash for making a comment saying Blackout Tuesday. I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because you decided to um, black out and not buy from me. So uh, her heart was in the wrong place um, in that. So, you know, Black leaders have made mistakes in their comments as well. But uh, I just want to um, emphasize, speaking of when I talk about, you know, spending power that we have, July 7th, 2020, blackout, the official blackout, do not spend a dollar on that day. And the purpose of that is so they can see, you know, how much we contribute to this economy, how much we stimulate the economy, how much we, we patronize businesses and, and keep the government afloat. You know, we've just got stimulus checks. Some of us um, have got stimulus checks and they're doing it so that we can stimulate the economy. They weren't doing it to help us because of COVID-19. They were doing it to re-stimulate the economies so we can continue to spend more, which is what we already do. So that's one change we can do. Strategize, come together, figure out what we're going to spend our money. Um, stop spending on people who don't care about us, who are not on our side. Um, as far as white people, you know, don't just support us, patronize our business. And when you patronize, don't stop at patronizing us, actually brag on us. Put us on your platform, put us on your stages and stop talking about your famous um, black friends, but talk about unknown, ambitious black entrepreneurs who are contributing to, to your success, you know, yeah. uplift us. So that's what I have. Awesome. Go ahead, Darren. Okay. Brian, let me ask you, what, what was the previous question oh, yeah. that, that you had before then? And then I'm just going to work in, work it right into. Uh, where, where were we at here? Actions that we can take that you're talking about? That one right the actions yeah. you can take and what the question that you asked just now was do you believe change will come okay so actions we can take from my end is this um and this is my message to anybody white watching this the biggest thing you can do is have conversations within your culture that's what malcolm x talked about the biggest thing you want to do something you feel bad you feel horrible you genuinely feel that way just have the conversation and address the issues, but it's going to be a difficult conversation. And here's why. There's a couple of key things in there that you have to do that's going to get you ostracized, get people looking at you badly, because the conversation we're talking about you having is not in some bunker somewhere with a KKK dude with a swastika on his arm and in the, in the hood. No, what we're talking about is in your grocery stores, in your churches, in your communities, in your homes, in your bedroom. You're having some serious conversations there and you're starting the best conversation you can plant the seeds with your children. Just like, you know, sister was talking about with, you know, how they came, you know, to school different, talking differently because of the seeds that were planted. You need to look at the seeds that you were planting right there. That's the difficult conversation um, because the reality is some of these people are going to disagree with you, not like you, maybe even unfriend you, not do business with you. So that's what I mean. If you really care, it's not just about posting something up on social media. Protest is about you actually doing something within your culture to keep the deaths uh, that can happen. As far as black people, community wise, one of the things I've said, uh, your go the go to playbook should be the same things that people have been doing in the Jewish community. You know, somebody who's worked out of Hollywood like myself and worked out of uh, the music industry and film industry, I picked up real quick is that Jews really don't have as much control as people think they have, meaning that, you know, they had this conspiracy, the Jews control the world. No, not true. The, what they have is influence. And the ability to use that influence is very important. But here's the important part, and that's the exciting part about it. There's about... 5 million Jews in this country. There's 40 million African Americans. And when you combine it with the other black and brown people, there's 80 million of us. We can have that equal influence in the media, in the legal system, and most importantly, this is America and the money, in the monetary system. Not just through uh, boycotting or just you know not buying things, but the bigger thing than not doing it is the threat of not doing it. Back in the 80s, a bunch of black people went to Coca-Cola and said, listen, man, we may have a Coke, but we don't have a smile because you're over in South Africa doing this apartheid bull and you're giving them Coca-Cola. Hey, either shut them down or be able to come over and, and, and deal with all of these tens of millions of black people 
we're no longer going to sip your drink. We're going to Pepsi. We're going to Sprite. We or whatever you know, whatever the Pepsi line is. You know, Sierra Mist. Whatever. We're going to their drinks before we go to yours because of apartheid. And they pulled out of apartheid financially. And they were like, okay, we understand. And they pulled out. The reality is that as black people, we can do that collectively by influencing, like I said earlier, not defunding, but influencing the police system um, that, that has their union contracts, the contracts with the city, the contract with profit, for profit, nonprofit, instead of defunding them saying, yeah, you're getting 30 million, what are, you, what are we gonna do about that? How can we influence a little bit of that money? Now as individual entrepreneurs, the things that we can also do is begin to look at how much money are we and how much dedication and teaching are we doing to other people of color? Like I said, 90% when I got on here, 90% of the people I have had as clients have been white, but I'm changing that around. It's not that I targeted white people. It's like, hey, you got money. I don't care if you are trans, you know, if you if you're a transgender Puerto Rican from El Segundo, I don't care. I love you, baby. We good. We good. But my point was, is that how can I specifically begin to target more African-Americans for the purpose of helping them become wealthier, helping them become more empowered and share resources of color? Now, the whole question that comes in, do, do I believe that things are going to change? Absolutely. Will there always be racism? Just like drugs. Absolutely. But can we lower the chances of them doing that? Absolutely. I've noticed something very interesting going back to my Jewish brothers and sisters playbook that, you know, the thing is, is that you notice that a lot of these guys who are racist, who may be in a police system or broad, they hate Jews almost just as much as they can't stand us. And I've seen them just go off on that. But yet they're not out there putting knees on their backs and beating the shit out of them. Why is that not happening? Excuse my language, but they're not doing it. Why is that not happening? Hmm. Well, let's talk about the influence again. Like I said, all the Jews don't control Hollywood. All the Jews don't control the legal system. And all the Jews don't control the media uh, or, um, or the financial system. But they have influence because for the last 2,000 years, uh, you know, every country they went to was majority Christian. That they went to majority Christian, they would lie on them, they would kill them, and they would take their money. So it would makes sense that, of course, you would have generationally people who have influence in the media. So, you know, deal with the propaganda and deal with the legal system and deal with the money system. So just in case they need to grab some money and break or they need some financial collective uh, power to influence the police stay in the political systems to do that. So they're not just protesting, but they are protesting the anti-defamation league. They get out there and protest too. And at times we're there with them right there, you know, but the whole idea is, it's not the protest, is how do you begin to get economically involved? And I have hopes that this is not only gonna open up the conversation of, of what's happening so that we can deal with this before we, you know, sew it up. We ain't putting no Band-Aid on the bullet wound, but it's my hope uh, to everyone, whether they're white or black, is to understand uh, that there's something on each side can be addressed. And from an economic perspective, it's my hope that black people, and I do have uh, an optimistic view that black people are going to get better and better and more and more conscious. Not everybody, but they're going to get freer, they're going to get wealthier, and they're gonna to begin to realize their inner wealth and their inner system and their inner power. Like I tell people, you know, my favorite group uh, besides the Roots is, you know, my first favorite group in hip hop was Public Enemy and they say fight the power. Now I'm thinking become the power because we can become people of influence and believe it or not, doesn't have to always be collectively. You got Jay-Z and, and, and Bay right now who are calling up people you know, the, the Minnesota governors, the mayors and Congress and people and they're gathering, not just the famous people, but the entrepreneurs who are also getting together, the business owners are getting together and saying, OK, who has what contract where and what city? How can we influence that? Or better yet, how can we as investors like Nas is an investor in major startups? He can get the same startups who are 
funding the Philadelphia police, for instance, GoFundMe, uh, go, excuse me, go, go Puff, uh, which is a del convenience delivery service out of Philly, he can get at them who they've given $25,000, $30,000 to the local Philadelphia police instead of, you know, saying defund, what way can you get in on the training and the reform actions that need to happen within the police system? Yeah. So there are ways that have been happening behind the scenes. Being in the media industry, I've been part of groups for the last uh, basically week. Uh, we've been talking about what ways can be done to hopefully do the long-term game. There's the short-term game. There's the long-term game. See, the money that's being held back from July 7th is one thing. But how can we make threats July 7th? 2020 to July 7, 2021, where they really understand the bigger picture is you need to not just visibly on social media get visible, but how can you get more invested into solving the problem of police brutality and beginning to recognize us? And as entrepreneurs, how can we begin to recognize our own power within ourselves and serve not only our community and our clients better, but how can we become more empowered from that? So I am hopeful in that. And I believe those solutions are things that people can begin to do. I started clipping this little image on there saying what white people can do, what police can police the police, a black people can police. So every time I see it on social media, instead of just writing anything long or cutting and paste, I just put the image up there. Okay, this is what y'all can do. This is what y'all, y'all wanna do something? Here's what you can do. You wanna be, you a good cop? Okay, great. How can you be a great cop? How can you begin to find at least platforms? And I understand that the good cops are in trouble because the truth is, if you've been on the street, snitches get stitches in the police just as much. You could get ostracized, your career could be over, and you literally in some cases could die over running your mouth over stuff because you may not get back up in a situation. The unions can go wrong. I can understand it. Every you know, there's It, it gets technical, but the point is this. What can you really do to acknowledge to the people who are now listening because of this? What can you do to have real police reform where you can have real platforms that good cops can call out the bad cops? And then how can they go street on it? You know, just like they go street on us and, and, and brown people. How can they put, how can 10 of these cops, for every one of them, pull them in a little side corner and say, listen, we're going to F you up if you don't start getting right because this ain't right. How can you socially condition bad cops and how can you identify the ones to either get them out or socially condition them to get right like they should? So I believe there's hope there, but there are things that are long-term and things that are short-term that people can be doing. Do you want to protest? Do you want to see things on social media? Fine, I'm for it. But at the same time, how do you do the long-term situation both in your business and going forward? Long answer, but there it is. So. <laughs> So I, I don't know, that was awesome. That was great. So last, <laughs> last um, um, just last just word to educate those with platforms on the importance of not missing this moment. Cause I think mm. I think some are still missing the moment. But tell us mm. just um, real quick, what is the importance of not missing this moment right now in in this in this, in this current event? Um, racism of this movement or or any kind of movement or just just conversation about the i don't want to say maybe maybe not being silent i guess or just just give me what you just give me what you, what you think but the importance of not missing this moment go ahead Galen. Um, well, I can say as far as, as far as educating them, um, right now, every white leader, if you have a Facebook group, if you are a leader of a community, you have any power, go ahead right now and make a post and direct it to the black people in your community and ask them, what do you want from us? Where have we missed the mark? Um, where have we hurt you? What we have avoided? What are we not doing? What can we continue to do? Ask us, make a post just for us and make it about us, not about you. Make it about us. Ask us what we want and ask us what we need. That's the only way you can know how to help if you ask. So right now, what you can do right now, if you're listening, go ahead in your Facebook group, your community, or on your own personal Facebook profile page. Ask, what can I do to help? 
how can I change how I serve you better um, mm -hmm. as far as our community? As he said, our culture, what can I do? So that's one of the first things you can do as far as ed educating. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Derek. Good idea. <laughs> Anything else on that? Good idea. I mean, that's I, I think that's I think that's an an excellent 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 idea, and it's a smart idea from the money perspective too. Because you know, black folks, man, let me tell you, you will go. I just got through talking about this with my man Michael. We were talking about this uh, last night. We're like, you know, black folks will go to the other side of the earth if we get treated better. So if you wanted to pull that subject out and target that group and be able in within targeting that group actually come out with, okay, what do you think can be done? What do you think this platform can be done to serve or help you better? That's that's just target marketing. That is just so smart to do that. That's incredibly intelligent uh, to do that. Um, I, I think that's incredible. I think the only other thing is seeing what opportunities there are for other platforms. You know, are there any, you know, funnel building owned, black platforms, whether African-American here or black platforms that could be out there that we could at least test out. We're not going to say it's right or wrong or it's the best platform. Maybe it's not, but at least be able to give them the try, the the opportunity to, you know, do right or wrong and see what, uh, you know, what what's out there. Um, I think that's, you know, the probably the best thing uh, to have the conversation, the education, um, and, and do it in a way, if you're doing this with whites, it's not necessarily, um, you know, shouting at them. I really want people to really be able to take it and roll with it to the culture and don't feel, you know, bad about it. It's not about pointing the finger. I mean, it's obviously, you know, it's like you, when you see wrong, you don't really have to point the finger at the officer to kill that man. You just, you know, you have to do what needs to be done. I mean, it just automatically rolls like that. Same thing with the platforms. You know, if they want to be able to speak out and 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 say things uh, and communicate, uh, yeah, open the door to the conversation and don't avoid it. I mean, just don't ignore it. Don't get so afraid you don't say anything. Same thing goes for other entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, I, I just, you know, it just disheartened me that there are so many people we're doing that. And black people, let me tell you right now, people with the African-American, half, half, whatever, black and white, mixed. I mean, we're all mixed, but, you know, mixed or for that matter, whatever. Don't be afraid not to have the conversation because you may hurt your business. The reality is, is that if you really want to be an authority, you got to be polarizing any damn way. You got to say what the hell you want to say. You know, that's why you got a bunch of people saying we love Apple because of the way this Steve job was. And ironically, Apple says, no, we're not PC. We're a Mac. Well, what's a Mac? It's a personal computer. Oh, you mean a PC? So, I mean, the point is, is that if you can get them excited to the point where they're in line, you don't ever hear stories about people in line for Androids, even though they are. It's like, yeah, Android, whatever. But it's all about, you know, it's all about that Apple, baby, about that Apple. You know, so the point is, is that if you can go from that level and be polarizing, not to be insulting or rude or hurt people, but be polarizing by saying, this is what I stand for, stand against, and be able to do that. I, I challenge African-American entrepreneurs in particular, because I'm the one that this week alone has made that change where I was like, you know, one that I wasn't willing to talk about black things. It's just that, okay, I kept it all business. And it's like, well, fuck it. You know, and ironically, excuse me, I've done another word again, bad there, bad there. But the thing <laughs> is, is that ironically, um, I've had people come out who have been from every country out there and been like, yeah, Darren, yeah, we support you, blah, blah, you know, which has been exciting. It's been exciting. Like I said, um, the biggest things that uh, I think that can be done with African-Americans is being able to speak out and, and address the conversation, white people being able to have the conversation. And like Sister said, I think you said perfectly, being able to really, and it's smart, it's smart target marketing, both platforms be able to target people and know that it's here. Address that it's happening. Don't ignore the shit. Just, you know, address it. Be real with it. And don't say something just politically correct. Open up that wound or that wound that's already open. Address it. Be able to do something with it. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Awesome. So that was my last question. I just want to leave it. Uh, I, I will. I just want to tell people before we go here, and I'm going to 
let you guys know where um, I'll, I'll introduce you guys. Well, what am I trying to say? <laughs> I'll let you have your thing out the way, should I say. We don't really want these conversations. I think that's I think that's been 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 put out there like we don't want to talk about race. You know, that's that's not we don't really want to have these conversations. We're just there are times where that we are just as as uncomfortable as you are, as as our white counterparts are. But there's a point where we have to. I didn't want to do this a, a week ago, but I just felt, you know, Brian, you know, I, I have to. I didn't want to protest last week, but I said, Brian, I have to, because the racism in its current manner right now is still the same. So we have to. We don't want to. We never wanted to. But we're here and we're saying that we have to because it still exists. So that's why we're here. That's why we're, talk that's why we're talking about race and how we can do better and get better um, all around. So I just wanna thank you, Darren. Thank you, Galen, uh, for coming in here and speaking truth today for everyone to hear. It's necessary and it shouldn't stop here. So Galen, before we go, tell people where they can find you, please, um, online. Um, well, you can find me right here on Facebook, <laughs> facebook.com forward slash Galen Ferguson. Um, and you can follow me if you are interested in increasing your sales and your conversions with your business. Um, my website is from leads to conversions.com. And you will um, be able to hear my voice from here on out, just like Brian said, just like Darren said, I'm no longer going to be politically correct and just keep my profile for business. I'm going to start speaking up when I see injustice and people not doing wrong because if they, uh, if I don't speak up in my community, the white people in my community don't know that there's something wrong. I do believe people say, when they say, I didn't know, I do believe them. That's because I didn't say anything. And I'm not talking about how tired or bothered I am. So thank you, Darren. I will start being politically direct from here on out <laughs> and speaking up. That's right. Go ahead, sister. Go ahead. See, see everybody watching this, this, all the white people watching this, what Brian really meant to say was, see here, whitey. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 like, this is what you need to do. No, seriously. Seriously. Um, here, here, here's, it, it, to reach me at, you know, I, I basically help people build virtual uh, workshops and micro subscription um, um, programs where, you know, they can where they can make monthly money and be able to open up their workshops uh, and in real simple ways, um, the opposite of the gurus. And you can go to DarrenMonroe.com and be able to reach me there. Um, but uh, yeah, the the. <laughs> The whole thing is, is that it's, it's time to have that open, honest uh, conversation from the heart. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's weird. It's not that I don't want to have the conversation. It's just, you know, for instance, I'm also a black geek. I, you know, I'm nerding out. I'm over here watching, you know, binging on DS9 for like the 18th time with Avery Brooks and that cool voice he has, that cool voice and 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 talking about other cool stuff. And I'm obviously, I, I got into films because I was a film and movie person and the music person and I was in a band and there's so much diversity within each one of us. And, and, and so a lot of people talk about, and I love to talk about business and entrepreneurship and 25 years of marketing, I always talk about, you know, different campaigns and marketing and blah, blah. I love talking about that. The reason I talk about this is from the spirit of my mama who marched with King, is from the spirit of my father and grandfather who fought for this country, is from the spirit of my great grandmother whose house was burned down by the Klan, but spoke up and rebuilt up and they never touched a house again. It's from those spirits and those things that break through that need to happen. As I said in the beginning, as a culture, uh, we don't have uh, African-American culture. We don't have the convenience or the luxury of not speaking 
about our culture, but we too, along with white people have been doing a dance where we've tried to, you know, keep the business and there's still African-American entrepreneurs right now who have said nothing. They just been straight on their business. I ain't mad at you, brothers and sisters. I just want you to realize that, you know, when you look back in history, and that's the thing I talked to people from the 60s, I say, you when you look back in history, what were you doing? Because there are going to be people asking you, younger people, whether you got kids or not, ask you, what were you doing at that time? Where were you? And when this happened, I want to say that I spoke up. I want to say that I reached out. Maybe I didn't protest because I didn't want that wrong. But still, <laughs> I'm just saying I did have my own way of protesting safely so I could live and be able to do and be able to reach out and touch people in my own way. And I encourage everybody, whether they're black or white, to do that. I mean, so yeah, you can reach me at DarrenMonroe.com or here at Darren Monroe on Facebook. But I mean, please just, just step up and re step up. Black folks, don't be afraid to get out there. Put yourself out there. Like like the gay, like the LGBT community tells people, come on out the closet. Let me tell you, come on out that racial closet that you may not be in. And I'm sorry, LGBT, I mean no disrespect if you think I'm you know, trying to compare to what you're going through. But I think you get the point uh, respectfully. And I'm saying to white people, don't be afraid to have the conversation. I'm glad Drew Brees said what he said, because now he now gets a chance to get his education on that. He gets a chance to get a real check on that. I mean, he said that in a black city, you know, as the head of saints for a black city. So I'm sure it's just a few black folks that are gonna let them know what they think. And, you know, at least at that point, if you feel that way, if you really feel that that was the narrative for this man taking the knee, um, Colin Kaepernick taking the knee, if you really feel that was the narrative, let's re-educate that. See, here's the thing. We're dealing with the narrative, but we need to start going after the narrators and we need to start having our own narration. You know, that's a big deal, a big, big deal, man. And uh, I have to say out of 15 years, I, I have not been forefront enough about that unless you got me in a private conversation and i got real with you as brian you know i've gotten real with you over the years yeah. we never really had a forefront conversation but yeah. now it's time to have that conversation at the forefront and say hey listen um you know this this is something that should be a, a concern yeah. and you know let's let's talk about it and let's address it because and and i do it as entrepreneur you know we, we should do that, just like our Latino brothers and sisters should do it. Our Jewish brothers and sisters should do it. Everybody should do it from their culture and speak on it. So, yeah, thank you for inviting me here, Brian. Sister, it's good to meet you. I reached out, gave you a friend request. You better take my friend request and friend <laughs> question. And, uh, yeah, awesome. everybody, um, that's that's I, all. I appreciate it. And this is the, um, the Authority Project, uh, probably one of our – it's our longest episode so far, and an important Thanks one. <laughs> an important one for sure. I, I didn't want it to stop, really. So, you two stay, stay, hold on for me after we finish just for a minute. But I appreciate everybody coming through here. Please, if you have questions, you put them on the comments below. Um, DM me. I'm everywhere, Brian S. Arnold. Um, get involved with the Authorities Builders Academy. Uh, we talked about building your authority so you can sell what you're great at. And we will see you shortly on the next episode. Take care. Have a great weekend. Love you guys. Be blessed.